All right, so I'm Chris Bryant, senior pastor. Thanks so much for joining us here in worship at Ringland United Methodist Church, both in person and online, whether you're several uh, streets over or a number of states away. We're glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. We're finishing a theme of recovery. Uh, we have recovery at Ringgold here and have for the last nine years. Uh, it's a wonderful celebration of the incredible mission and ministry of reaching out to everybody that has hangups or issues or feel that they're stuck in life. Uh, and uh, with this uh, Thursday night, 6.30 worship service, small groups to follow. And um, you know what? Everybody needs recovery from something. That's part of the reason I've been doing this series. We're not only are we celebrating recovery in this nine years of ministry. By the way, that's every Thursday, rain, sleet, snow, or shine. Um, holiday or not, Thursday at 6.30. And uh, I just hosted this last Thursday. I'm going to host again. This is uh, one of those rare times where two weeks in a row I'll be hosting. And so if that makes you more comfortable, drop in for a visit. Uh, and if you need somebody to sit with you, I'll sit with you. I'll say hello. Or if you want me to avoid you, I will do that too. Whatever's more comfortable uh, for you, I'll be glad uh, to do whatever I can. Would love for you to visit with us in recovery and uh, consider uh, we'll, lo- we'll go at least one time regardless and then maybe consider going more often than that. Okay, so um, everybody needs recovery from something, whether that is a formal program of recovery like we offer here, Recovery at Ringgold, or whether it is an acknowledgement of some sort of rigorous discipleship. Uh, Recovery is Christian spirituality. The 12 steps are Christian spirituality. Uh, It is a powerful reminder and practice, very specific practice of the faith. And that's where we want to go today. We want to think about the importance of practicing, putting into practice our faith. Um, We have talked about divorce and codependence as a reason why you'd want to be a part of recovery uh, ministry. We've talked about grief and loneliness, alcohol and chemical dependency, and last week, debt and overspending. We're going to finish today thinking about the idea of compulsions or acting under compulsion, uh, compulsively. Uh, and obsessions, uh, obsessive thinking, obsessive acting. Uh, This is a little something different than OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, which is a mental illness. Um, Some people in your life may have tried to accuse you of being, uh, having OCD. We normally um, joke about that. Many of us do. And, um, you know, they can tease you because they think that you're Uh, you are too insistent on a clean, neat house, and you can just say, no, you're messy. You're just a messy person. I'm not, see? But but in reality, uh, OCD is a pretty serious thing, and if you've ever been diagnosed with it, um, there are aspects of recovery that can help you. Now, it doesn't replace counseling. Uh, Recovery doesn't replace medicine, But uh, nonetheless, there are aspects of it that would help somebody that is diagnosed with OCD. My father was diagnosed with OCD. I'm very familiar. I have lots of experience with um, that form of illness. And uh, um, people that actually have OCD, again, we we joke about it a lot. We'll tease about it. But people that actually have it have very specific, um, very distinct and peculiar kinds of behaviors. Uh, I thought I would just share very quickly. I watched my father... Um, on many occasions, I watched him unlock and lock the deadbolt on our kitchen door a dozen or two dozen times in a row. Lock, unlock, lock, unlock, lock, unlock. He couldn't help himself. Um, I watched him um, uh, measure the distance between the couch and the wall with a ruler, with like a tape measure, and go back and forth from one side of the couch to the next, making sure it was perfect back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. I watched my dad um, pull up and push down the dipstick on a car, which is where, how you check the oil. And he would pull it up and push it down, pull it up, 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 push it down. A dozen times, 15 times, 20 times. Now, if he was having a good day, he wasn't all that stressed out. It might only be three or four or five times. But it was really rough. I mean, he would do it a dozen and then go do something else and come back and Goodness, if he wouldn't start doing it again. Um, So it's a pretty serious thing. And what we're talking about today is not that. Um, I remember, I thought I'd share this too. Um, Remember that movie with uh, Jack Nicholson, As Good As It Gets? That's a movie that uh, takes OCD seriously, obsessive compulsive disorder seriously, but still makes it into a comedy. And uh, my dad thought it was hilarious. 
I remember watching that movie with my dad. And he just, I mean, he just rolled. He thought it was hilarious. Nobody else laughed. Uh, it was way too close to the painful reality for us. But my dad got a chance to laugh at himself and, and laugh at the surroundings. Um, when we talk about obsessive compulsive tendencies in recovery, we're not talking about OCD, you know, OCD obsessive compulsive disorder. What we're talking about is that which any of us can fall into at any time, where we obsess about something or we are, we're compulsively acting or compulsively thinking, uh, times in which we feel that we're out of control or that we have no choice but to act a certain way or say something, when the truth is we absolutely have control. We absolutely do. But we have those feelings because we're trying to compensate in some aspect in our lives of something else that actually is, is wrong. I have obsessive and compulsive tendencies as uh, someone that struggles with codependence and approval addiction. Um, obsessive compulsive thinking acting is again the way we try to make up for some other part of our life. Not feeling right, not being right, um, something about our life, uh, relationships or life in general. And we can't fix it, we can't address it, and so we're trying to overly control, overly act, or just act impulsively towards something else to relieve the pain or relieve the discomfort or somehow make it better. Um, in my case, a lot of my obsessive compulsive tendencies are good things and not all of them. Okay. Let me just, there's a couple that are pretty awful. Um, but, but I thought in order to relate to you and in order for you to understand this message can apply to everybody, everybody is in need recovery for something. Listen, I have values like being organized. I have a value of, um, being kind of neat and tidy. Um, I have um, values of hard work and success, success oriented. Uh, and those are normally very, very good things. But when you apply pressure and then you start to mismanage stress and you get out in the wrong place off balance emotionally and spiritually, these very things you can then begin to excess or act, act obsessively or compulsively, even in with good things in order to control that which you'll never control. And that's where we are today. That's what we're talking about. Um, you've probably seen examples of this or have been a part of it in your life. If you've not recognized that it's your own obsessive, compulsive kind of uh, traits or characteristics or tendencies. Uh, one example is if you've ever been in a fight or a conflict, or it's better if you've seen it in somebody else because then you're a little bit more objective, um, where the fight, the conflict, the argument it became pretty clear pretty quickly that it really wasn't about what it was about. Like the fight, the argument is over something, X, something, but then pretty quick you're like, it's not really about that. Like something's driving this. Well, that's, yeah. Now, not always, but, but a lot of times that's a sign of some kind of compulsion or obsession, a tendency that is, that is at work, which in itself is also not the problem but it's covering for a problem on the inside. Um, Kara told me this week about a person uh, that she knew um, when she first started teaching, and his name was Michael. And she said he was really, really good at noticing in parent-teacher conferences when this sort of thing was playing out. Uh, she said that she watched him at least four times, might have been more than that, but at least four times in a parent-teacher conference where a parent was really more upset than they should have been, more angry, more passionate, whatever, about some issue with their child. And pretty quickly, everybody in the room but that parent realized this isn't about that. That just doesn't make any sense. It's irrational. And she said that Michael was really good at just, in those moments, going over and just kind of touching that parent's arm gently, and then making really good eye contact, and then with great care saying, is there something else going on outside of school? And it's in those moments, she said, every time the parent would open up, talk about financial problems, talk about marital stress or marital issues, talk about a death in the family, talk about, you know, something that clearly they were compensating for, something that was really bothering them and getting at them and they couldn't control, they couldn't advocate for a difference in that area, that thing, that whatever. And so they're over trying to control the situation. Obsessive-compulsive tendencies. 
Um, she said that that's helped her and her and Michael's example. There's t- several times that she's been able to help a mom, several moms over the years that have tried to defend their kid, thinking their kid has been being treated unfairly. And of course, there's many times that's true and they, you know, you just got to work it out. But in these cases that she's referring to, it was so obvious from the word go, this has nothing to do with your child being treated unfairly. And as she kind of did the same thing, she realized, or she helped that person, that mom realize, this isn't about your kid being treated unfairly. It's the fact that you feel you're being treated unfairly at your job or in your marriage with your husband or in some other way. Most people, in fact, in their lives at times, at some point, will exhibit, demonstrate a compulsive or obsessive behavior or characteristic. If you think about it, there's probably circumstances in your life where if you look back, you think, oh yeah, I acted impulsively. I didn't really think about it. I just acted out. Or um, you, if, if it wasn't acting out, it was, it was um, obsessively thinking within. Right? If you didn't act out, it's like you became inward and you just get caught up in your own inward thoughts and you couldn't escape your inward thoughts. Uh, or you felt under compulsion. You acted a certain way even though you didn't really think you should act that way or you didn't feel like acting. You didn't feel like doing that, but you did anyway because for some reason you felt like you had to. That's acting compulsively. You're under compulsion to do it. Thinking that you have no choice or that you're forced to be, do it when that's not true. You have a choice. All of us at times, depending on what we're going through and how we're handling stress, or better said, mishandling stress, how we're doing emotionally, how we're doing spiritually with our faith, and and actually putting our faith into practice, can be vulnerable at times where we try to overcompensate. We try to compensate for a life that we're struggling with, for relationships that we're struggling with. We try to compensate for some area of our life that we cannot control, which is actually most of them by over-controlling or over-being involved or in, in, in some other area or simply just acting without thinking, trying to escape, trying to find joy, trying to find hope and happiness. Uh, sometimes we will cover that kind of behavior, that kind of obsessive or compulsive behavior by saying it is just doing our job. Well, it's just doing my job. I know it was rude and ridiculous, but you know that my job is to step in. <laughs> or, you know... Uh, it, it, you will say, well, I'm just trying to protect this, protect this thing, or protect this value, or protect this person. Or we'll say, um, uh, you, you know, uh, I'm just blown off steam. Uh, or, or, or I'm trying to keep busy, you know, I'm just trying to keep busy, trying to forget what's going on. And, and the thing is, you know, that might be the case. There's plenty of times in our life when we're doing those, those very things. That's actually what we're doing. But then there's other times when those, that's just a cover, And deep down inside, we really know that we're acting or thinking irrationally. We really don't have a good cause for it. We we really can't justify it. And we know this because, you know, it's really not blowing off steam. It's really not protecting this person or this thing. It's really not just doing our job because in the end, after we've done it, whatever this is, we feel worse. We're more frustrated. We're more fatigued. You know, we're more confused. We're more stressed out. We feel like we've wasted time and energy. We're regretful of how we've acted or thought or whatever it was that we're, we're talking about. Now, the most famous biblical passage uh, and illustration of this is a story that you probably have heard of. You might not have. But if you've heard of it, you can understand it. But rarely do I hear people relate to it. And that is the story of King Saul. King Saul was the very first king of Israel. And at some point in time in his life, he just loses his stuff. And that's all I'll say. He just, he just loses his stuff. And, and, and most of the time when I'm in Bible study with people, if they're reading it, especially for the first time, they'll, th- they'll say things like, well, he just went crazy. Because that's this is just what you would interpret. You're like this, he just lost his mind. He's crazy. And what he does, what, what we read in scripture is he his protege is David, who ultimately does become king. And instead of like continue to care for him and bringing him up and be proud of him, like he become he like decides to make David his enemy. He tries to kill him over and over and over again. I mean, it's just nuts. And what we have to realize is we don't relate to that story because hopefully none of us are trying to kill someone else. Right. Okay. Good. Um, but nonetheless, our obsessive compulsive acting or thinking at times means that we have come across as crazy. We have to admit that, that there are moments in our lives, it's not whole periods, but, but there are times when we 
And, and here's the thing, how do we know we're doing it? Because we ourselves, if we stop and are act and asked upon, or we're a part of something like recovery, or we're a part of some sort of disciplined, methodical, methodical, rigorous spirituality, we're going to be confronted with the truth, the reality that we have no reasonable, rational explanation for why it is we're doing what we're doing or thinking what we're thinking. And that's the key. You know, we are acting obsessively. We're acting under compulsion. We have these feelings inside of us that we're not really sure about, that we don't know what they mean or how to handle them. And we have all these thoughts in our head. And oftentimes these things and our thoughts and our feelings are not going together. And we're struggling with it. We're struggling with it. And instead of dealing with it, we oftentimes just act out or get caught up in a loop of negative thinking or whatever. I know of a young person... um, who recently I had this conversation with. It's been a little while now, but um, a few months back, I guess. <clears throat> and uh, they had this conversation with me because um, they kind of got caught in a lie with their parents. And they're not, it really wasn't a lie. It's just they just didn't tell the whole truth. Um, and everything's okay. And what they were thinking about doing that they didn't do, it really wasn't all that bad. It wasn't anything immoral. It really wasn't anything that was going to hurt them. But it was just really stupid. It was, it was just really ridiculous. It was, it was um, absurd. Uh, and so this is a person that's intelligent, hardworking, normally, you know, fully functioning. You know, and so the question became, so what, what in the world made you even consider doing this really ridiculous, absurd thing? And the thought was, well, there's this other person involved, and I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to let them down. Well, but this is irrational, what you're considering doing. It's unreasonable. Yeah, but I just, I just, I have to. I just feel like you you can almost hear the obsession, can't you? You almost hear the compulsion. I said, well, let's flip it around. Let's flip it around. What if this other person in question uh, was the one that was expected to do this thing, and you're on the receiving end? What if they came to you and said, look, I really can't do this. This really isn't rational. This really isn't reasonable for me to do. How would you feel about it? How would you feel about them? And this person's response was, well, I, you know, I'd be disappointed, but I get it because it's really ridiculous, this thing. I said, okay. So why is it so hard for you to accept that about yourself? Which really caught them. And it's the same thing that I'm going to tell you, Right. The problem isn't the obsession or the compulsion, it's what's driving it. And so I encourage them, look, you got to look deeper. I encourage them to seek a counselor. I I encourage them to seek um, more resources that are available to them. And I promised I would check up on them, and I will. Um, Because what I told them is, again, what I'm about to say to you. Because it's not going to go away on its own. Right? In this moment, in this time, nobody got hurt. It really wasn't that bad. You didn't even act on it. It wasn't even anything immoral or you know, hurtful to begin with. It was just ridiculous. But if you don't figure out where this is coming from and where those feelings are, why they're being generated inside of you, it's going to happen again. Right? These things don't go away on their own. You have to work on it. The person in question, like all of us, must become more healthy and more whole. We read in this scripture this wonderful passage that I would encourage you to remember, to retain by memory if you can. Finally, sisters and brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or worthy of praise, think on those things. I mean, that is an absolute contradiction to the obsessive compulsive acting and thinking that we can get into. It's an absolute antidote. In fact, what we read here further is Paul recommends, or writes rather, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. That's the key. We can know the truth, we can have these wonderful beliefs, but unless we put them into practice, they're not going to help us. But when we put them into practice, what we have learned, what we have received, what we have heard, what we have seen in the good example of others, when we put them into practice, we will experience the God of peace being with us. That's why recovery is so important, a formal program like we have it. 
That's why 12 steps are so important. That's why spiritual practices that we talk about called disciplines are important. Weekly worship, daily devotions, purposeful prayer, generous giving, um, uh, humble serving, readily faith sharing, you know, gathering in small groups for a genuine conversation. Um, These things are important because when we practice them, not in a rigid way, which is unhelpful, but rigorously, dare I say methodically, I mean, we are Methodists, right? That's when the power comes. Because it's then that we are confronted. When we're part of something that makes us be confronted, not just believe in the truth or accept the truth, but be confronted on a regular kind of way, the truth of our faith. Because very quickly, we can act and think in ways that are totally detached from what we actually believe. It's just human nature. It's just human nature. Even with the best intentions and the most genuine determination, we can quickly become sidetracked by stinking thinking, negative downward self-talk, having outlooks about life in general or other people specifically that have nothing to do with Christ. Very quickly we can become lost in our acting and our thinking. And even though we have strong Christian committed beliefs, let's just say, Nonetheless, we can act and think in those moments like a person who has never even heard of Christ. Because we're not putting into practice. Because to put into practice means being not rigid, but rigorous in our pursuit of the faith through spiritual disciplines or the 12 steps or recovery or whatever. Constantly, continually being reminded and confronted with the truth that we've already said we believe. Or that we're coming to believe. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or worthy of praise, think on those things. And whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Paul writes, put it into practice. And the God of peace, the God of wholeness, the God of harmony, the God of all things are well with my soul, that God will be with you. Many of us have these wonderful Christian beliefs and we are committed Christians and we just beat ourselves up too much when we realize we have to understand that, look, it's not a fault of our faith. It's not an issue that we don't have a good relationship with God. It's not that, you know, we're, we're bad Christians. We have to understand that there's things that happen to us early in life, in our formative years. Some of us very, very young. Some of us, it was in our teenagers. Some of us, it was in our early 20s, you know, when we were still actually developing a little bit. Some of us, it was so awful our physical survival was threatened. Others of us, it was just emotional. But the thing is, we, we developed certain things and ways of handling the world around us that at the time allowed us to survive. But as we've grown, those very same things are sabotaging our life as adults. And we see them occasionally when we act out under compulsive, compulsion, compulsion, or in an obsessive, compulsive way. Tendencies. As we see it, we're, we, we get alerted to it. We feel, oh, I'm acting irrationally. Or other people around us that love us say, you know, you're getting, you have your crazy moments. You know that, right? Bring every thought captive under the obedience of Christ. It's a phrase from 2 Corinthians that I often use. Because I, like anybody else, can go off on the crazy train at any moment. And what I'm talking about is emotionally. Just be on a ride that I'd never intended to get on in the first place. But everything that's going on, I'm not managing stress well. You know, any number of things. And all of a sudden, I'm on a, ride, I'm on a crazy train that I never intended to get on. Bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Why? Because that's the only thing I can bring captive. Because that's where the problem starts. The problem starts is I cannot control everything that I want to control. And so the only thing I can control is my own thoughts. Bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I can only control my own choices. No matter how hard I try, no matter how hard I work, I am not in charge of other people. (laughs) That's a good word. (laughs) No matter how hard, do you need to say that? No matter how hard I work, no matter how much I try, I am not in control in charge of other people. And sisters and brothers, if you're unfamiliar with the 12 steps, that's step number one. Not in control. I can't even manage my own life very well. You know, I can't. It's okay. It's okay. In fact, a good prayer to pray is this. Lord, help me to learn and to remember 
that I cannot manage my life or the lives of others. Help me to let go. I choose to let go. I admit that I am powerless and that my life is unmanageable. Those of us that are, uh, you know, most of us were raised to be successful and to be winners and all this. Man, it is hard to pray that kind of prayer. It seems counterintuitive to us. It seems like we're admitting that we have, I don't know, that we're, I, I don't even have the words for that this morning. You know, it's something, it's, it's so hard for us to say my life is unmanageable. It's like it goes against everything that we were ever trained or taught. But the truth is, it's just the way it is. The only thing I can manage is my thoughts right now. I can't even tell you that I'm going to manage my thoughts tomorrow because who knows what I'll do. All I can say is right now, here in this moment, I pledge as best by the grace of God to control the thoughts and my actions here and now. That is so critical for us. Because so many of us were raised to think if we just did a certain number of things and we acted a certain way and if we were just competitive enough and if we just were successful enough, we'd be winners of life. And many of us right now wonder to ourselves, at least by ourselves when no one else is around, maybe sometimes outwardly with others, I think I'm a failure, we think. We think I'm I'm just, I'm a loser. You know, we weren't the best dressed. We weren't the best looking. We weren't whatever. And we wonder if we, and, and that's the thing, we can actually handle not being the best. What we can't handle is feeling like, am I ever going to fit in? I'm not preaching a good word today, am I? This is, this is, this is recovery stuff, man. This is real life stuff. And, and because of all those inadequacies and shortcomings and fears of failure, and that, that's when we end up doing things that are just are irrational and, and just unreasonable. We have to be constantly confronted with some form of methodical, rigorous spirituality. Step one, I can't manage my life. Step two, God can. And, and you know, again, we get hung up here because we believe God can, but, but here, if you didn't get nothing else from the sermon, get this. And we talked about this on Thursday of recovery. It's so good. It's so good. If you don't get anything else from the sermon, get this. Step number two is I believe God can manage my life. But what that means is God needs to manage my entire life. What it doesn't mean is, God, if you'll just give me a little bit of help, I'm all set. And most of us, when we come to church and we practice our spirituality, that's our attitude. If I just get a little bit of help, God, I'm all good. I'm good. I'm all set. But we're not all set. We're going to end up in the same brokenness. I can't do it, God. I can't do it. You can, God. I really believe in Jesus Christ. You can take care of me. You can return my life to sanity. You can make things better. You can make all things well. Not because you're going to change everything around me, but because you're going to work in me and work through me. It's so critical. I have a whole list, if you're interested in, I don't have time to read today, of all kinds of things that people say all the time that alert them or could alert you to obsessive compulsive thinking or tendencies. Don't have time to read it. Some of them are really, really good. Um, Anyway, but Ultimately, what we want to get to is step number three, which means uh, not only do I say and confess, I can't manage it, I can't do it, which is so hard for us, and then to actually say God needs to do it and mean it, like God really needs to do it, not just help me a little so I can keep doing it. Step number three is, Lord, I surrender to you, which means we move away from spirituality being just a part of our life to it being the, the, the center from which all of our life comes. Which, you know, and, and some people, we need, we need recovery. We need a formal program to help us do it. We need the 12 steps. We need, but all of us need some form of practice, of rigorous practice. Put into practice these things you've learned and heard and seen from me, Paul writes. Put them in. We have to have some form, not rigid, but rigorous practice of the faith to get down deep into these places in our life that are broken, some of which come from an early part of our life where we did things that helped us then, but as adults, it's sabotaging our efforts. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is, whatever is admirable, if there are anything excellent or worthy of praise, think on those such things. Our healing begins, friends, when we stop making excuses. Our healing begins when we become willing to acknowledge our own problems. Our healing begins when we practice the spiritual disciplines or work the steps. Here's the phrase we use in recovery an awful lot. Work the steps because the steps work. Practice the spiritual disciplines because the spiritual disciplines work. Don't neglect them. 
Our healing comes when we fully realize and accept that we cannot get what we need by manipulating our environment, thinking that if this changes or that changes, or if I can just fix this, or if this would get better, or if this would be different, everything else will be okay. It'll never end up okay. It'll never end up okay. Healing comes when we fully realize only when we spiritually focus, when our whole life springs from our spirituality. Not that it's a part of our life, but everything comes from our spirituality. Doing our work of recovery, working the steps, or as Paul writes, working out our own salvation, however you want to imagine it. Then, and only then, each day becomes a new opportunity to admit from the beginning our powerlessness and our, unabil- our inability to manage our own lives, let alone the lives of anybody else. To believe that God, who we have come to know in Jesus Christ, can and will return us to sanity. And finally, to submit and surrender to that God through practicing our faith, put into practice everything you've heard and learned and remember and saw in me, Paul writes. Practicing our spirituality, taking each day, one day at a time, one step at a time, embracing pain as a normal part of life, accepting that we can be reasonably happy in this life with God's help and supremely happy in the next. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for the grace that is found in our faith. Help us to recognize how often, oh God, that we compartmentalize, we put you in a box, or, or otherwise we, we have these beliefs or the spirituality. It really is important to us. You're really important to us, God. And yet very quickly we can come be, become detached from those things and, and make it just a part of our life and, and then wonder where and why everything else is so messed up. Help us to realize that the world is always going to be broken, that life's always going to be messy, that there's always going to be 10,000 things to do. That's never going to change. But what can change is how we deal with it, how we live through it. Help us to embrace the hope, as we read read in the Scripture today, that you, the God of peace, is with us. May we practice the faith. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.